March 18, 1913. Across the globe, headlines were reporting the assassination of King George of Greece. His death at the hands of an anarchist foreshadowed the political violence that would soon plunge the world into war. President Woodrow Wilson, just 14 days into his first term, was announcing a new policy, repudiating the dollar diplomacy that had guided foreign relations during the Taft administration. In North Carolina, the unusually warm winter had farmers praying for a late cold snap to kill off a parasite called the San Jose scale that threatened their fruit trees. And in the towns of Salem and Winston, residents were going to the polls to vote on a proposal to consolidate their towns under one city government. Just 34 years earlier, in 1879, they had soundly rejected the idea. That failed effort reflected a lingering political acrimony between the towns that dated back to the founding of Winston in 1849. A second consolidation proposal in the 1890s never got far enough to be put to a vote. But this time, boosters were confident that the citizens of the Twin City would embrace this merger of identities, and so they did. One hundred years ago, Winston and Salem, two independent municipalities, merged their governments and their identities under the hyphenated name of Winston-Salem. It was a unique consolidation in the history of North Carolina. Virtually every other county grew up around a single central municipality. From the start, however, Forsyth County had two. The result was government and duplicate, with two town councils, two police forces, two fire departments, and two water companies. And yet, from a bird's eye view, these two municipalities comprised a single, contiguous urban area, delineated only by the center line of a street. The story of how Forsyth County came to this peculiar arrangement is fraught with political rivalry, the conflicting desires of business and religion, and the accidents of geography that dictate how cities grow. Our story starts in the town of Salem, founded in 1766 by settlers with the Moravian Church to administer their colony in North Carolina, called Wachovia. The Moravians invest in 100,000 acres, basically near the Yadkin River, with the idea of implanting several settlements there. Ultimately, they would develop a town in the middle of that 100,000 acres, and that town they called Salem. Salem was chosen as, of course, peace, Salam. They were a very religious people. They came to North Carolina for religious freedom, but they also wanted to create a community that they could, in essence, build a stockade around. They were not really in tune with a lot of the things that we think of as American. Uh, they were pacifists during the Revolutionary War. They agreed to pay double tax and eventually triple tax to be exempt from military service. In keeping with their religious beliefs, the Moravians created a communal society that valued women's education and believed that all were equal before God. It was manifested even in African Americans who were perhaps enslaved but owned by the congregation. They could belong to the church, they could uh, be buried in God's acre, they could take common communion cup, what have you. This egalitarian society was regulated by the church, which retained ownership of the land inside the town and controlled all aspects of civic life. Salem, the town of Salem, was a theocracy that meant the church functioned as the primary control, social control mechanism. With the church making the decisions, both the religious decisions and the social and economic decisions. And they did control not only who could live in town, but they also controlled who could go into business, what type of business, they controlled everything. 
In Salem, what, what happens, of course, is after the American Revolution, the idea of personal freedom and independence is, is very much on people's minds, and the citizens of Salem begin to redirect their attention less to congregational consensus and uniformity, looking more toward their family in a traditional sort of way. What is good about my family, the house that I live in, the money that I can make? And the industrialization, of course, has a key part of that, is when you sort of move out of the individual shops where a person is with his own hands making a rifle or making pottery or making things to where you actually need outside labor to come in to manufacture that and generate the wealth that that produces, then where does that wealth go? Does that go to an individual or does it go back to the congregation? This caused tension. The, the business leaders in Salem wanted an unfettered hand to develop business as they saw fit. And so the, the church, which basically felt like, well, we bought this territory and we lease lands and we, should, we want to control the lands, uh, they just uh, kept, they started meeting head on head uh, uh, on one issue after another. For the business leaders in Salem, differences with the church were only half the problem. They were also hindered by their political situation. In North Carolina, in order to make things operate, you had to have a county seat, and you had to have a county seat close by. And if you look at the history of in Salem, or where they, they are now, they were in Rowan County, uh, so they had to go to Salisbury and do business. And then they were in uh, Surrey County, and they had to go to Rockford to do business. And then when Stokes County was created, they had to go to Germantown to do business. And you had a lot of dynamic people up in that part of the country. And of course, these were large slaveholders, um, and their interests were totally out of line with anything that the Moravians believed. With the rise of political parties in the 1840s, the business-oriented residents of Salem gravitated to the Whig Party, but they were outnumbered by the farmers in the rest of Stokes County who were drawn to the Democratic Party started by Andrew Jackson. This made life more difficult for Salem. If you go to Salem in the 1840s, you have the most industrialized community in North Carolina with cotton mills operating, with money being spent on expanding and, it, and it's going gangbusters in Salem. And yet you have to go do your, your business up in Germantown and Germantown increasingly is controlled by people who are identified as Democrats. And Salem had no control there. To the business leaders in Salem, the solution was obvious. Salem needed to have its own county. The economic faction thought that if they had a county government that related more to Salem and, and, and its environs, then they would be better off. Part of the dynamic of wanting a separate county was, at that time, very little authority was given to, to local communities. And so if you wanted to change an ordinance almost, if you wanted to uh, change a boundary, if you wanted to change the way you do business, if you wanted to change the name of the place, you had to go to the General Assembly and get the General Assembly to agree. So you needed to have a very strong delegation to the North Carolina General Assembly. So yeah, they, they found themselves at a disadvantage if you look at who went to the General Assembly after 1840, uh, not one of them came from Salem. As settlers populated the northern portion of Stokes County, Salem found itself outnumbered and unable to send sympathetic representatives to the General Assembly. This combined with democratic control of the legislature thwarted any effort to form a separate county. Then came the election of 1848. War hero and Whig candidate Zachary Taylor won the presidency. His coattails extended to North Carolina and gave the Whigs temporary control of the legislature. And the business leaders in Salem say, we now have an opportunity. So let, let's do it. So they, they go to the North Carolina General Assembly and say, we want to create a new county, Forsyth County. Francis Fries went to Raleigh to lobby the Whig legislators for the division. 
The Democrats of Stokes County resisted vigorously and orchestrated a stream of petitions in opposition. Mr. Free spent four weeks at Raleigh in the interest of the proposed division, lobbying among the members, shaping their opinions, and winning their support. The necessity for the long stay and the diligence of the lobbyists at Raleigh shows that there was determined opposition. Robert Gray, 1876. In the end, the majority of Whigs prevailed. In 1849, the southern half of Stokes County was carved out. The new county was named in honor of Lieutenant Colonel Benjamin Forsythe, a native son killed during the War of 1812. Francis Fries, in recognition of his leadership, was named the chairman of the new county board of commissioners. And then they made their fatal mistake. That was, uh, Salem was the logical place to be the county seat. Where else would you put it? But they had some problems with that. They knew that every county courthouse, uh, every courthouse town in North Carolina brought in riffraff. When the circuit court came, uh, this was when a group of uh, judges and lawyers and others would come uh, to the court, uh, spend the night usually, or maybe even two or three nights, depending on how long the circuit, circuit court would last. It wasn't like it is today, where court's in session every day. Court was only in session infrequently. And because uh, it took so long for people to travel from the far reaches of the county to the county courthouse, they tended to turn it into kind of a park. <laughs> people would park their wagons and the booze would start flowing. And it's party time and the Moravians were not party people. <laughs> Break it up. <laughs> so there's drinking going on, there's uh, prostitution going on, there's any number of things that just rubbed the, the, the Moravians the wrong way and said we want nothing, absolutely nothing to do with that. And the other thing, of course, that, that created a big problem for them was in those days, typically for a crime, uh, what, what we would consider a misdemeanor or even a felony now, uh, the punishment was a fine. And if you couldn't pay the fine, then the punishment was whipping post. Which means if you're going to be the county seat, you're going to have to have a whipping post. This just wasn't Moravian. So the church leaders in Salem knew that wherever that courthouse went, it was going to bring another kind of uh, activity that they weren't uh, eager to bring in. But, on the other hand, the, the power structure that wa was rising in Salem at the time was very anxious to see that. And of course, these, these people basically uh, were leaders in the town of Salem. They were Moravians, but they had a different attitude. The businessmen of Salem wanted the courthouse and the commerce it would bring as close to Salem as possible. But church leaders wanted to keep the courthouse and its corrupting temptations at some distance. They offered the commissioner's land several miles away. The uh, church leaders in Salem decided exactly where the courthouse should be. And so they selected a spot and said, you can build your courthouse here. However, that happened to be in a great big gorge. And <laughs> it was a place where the courthouse could not possibly be built. The courthouse should be. After more debate, the businessmen forced the issue by putting the question to a vote. Brothers and sisters of the congregation. Does the congregation council favor having the courthouse built as close to Salem as possible? The vote was 57 in favor to 10 opposed. The ayes have it. Yes. Unable to resist further, the church sold the county 51 and a quarter acres immediately north of the town. The pastor of Home Moravian Church expressed ambivalence about these developments in the Salem Diary. Not without concern does one see many things developing which will affect our Salem greatly. The Lord alone knows what effect the cotton factory and the courthouse can still have on us as a congregation. Salem is becoming larger, but is it becoming better in the sight of the Lord? And so they proceed uh, full speed ahead. They set up a a group of commissioners to establish the new county. The commissioners consist completely of, of Salem business people. 
uh, and and there it's like you know Nirvana has arrived. We're now going to be in control of things, but that was not to be. Of course, the commissioners took the land, subdivided it because they're going to auction off these lots, all but the courthouse and the jailhouse lot, uh, to get some operating capital. Now, if the Moravians had been thinking carefully, they would have gone up there and bought every lot, but they didn't. And the people that came in and bought the lots were the very people that they'd been putting up with all these years. <laughs> and, and so immediately they lost control of the county town. The Whig commissioners and the Salem businessmen assumed that the new county seat would be called Salem. And in fact, deeds issued after the auction bore the name of Salem, as did early maps of the new county. This did not sit well with the non-Moravian Democrats who now found themselves inside a Whig-controlled county. Francis Fries, as county chairman, ignored their complaints and declared that the county seat would be known as Salem. But this only made matters worse. To defuse the growing protest, Fries reversed himself and called for an election to decide the name. This, in turn, raised such a ruckus among the Moravians that Fries reversed himself again and canceled the election. And so the farmers, the plantation owners, said, we're just not going to let you guys control things. Uh, we will uh, get it named what we would like it to be named. So now it's payback time. Yeah, let's see, who's the worst person we could possibly think of that would offend the most Moravians? Ah, uh, yeah, Winston, a soldier. Uh-huh. So there you go. Uh, Joseph Winston was from Stokes County. He was a, a hero of the American Revolution and a very venerated figure. Uh, had nothing to do with Salem. Had nothing to do with Wachovia. I mean, why? I mean, if, if, if we're going to change the name, why don't we call it Zinzendorf? You know, or you know, something uh, nice and, and uh, Moravian-like. With the Democrats back in control in Raleigh, Salem was outmaneuvered. In January 1851, the General Assembly decided the issue. Be it enacted by the General Assembly of the State of North Carolina, and it is hereby enacted by the authority of the same, that hereafter the county town of Forsyth County shall be styled and known by the name of Winston. With the extended controversy over naming the county seat, relations between the towns were off to a rocky start. For the next 15 years, they would only get worse. The first wedge is the naming of the town. The, the second wedge, really, is all the land that's bought up. And it's bought up by speculators. And the speculators bring in a lot of people who are not compatible with the religious community in Salem. And for the traditional Moravians, who viewed this expansion as being detrimental to the 1849 establishment of Forsyth County, puts in play a whole new population and a geopolitical arena in which Salem is working. So all of these people show up and, and the, the war, which used to be in Germantown and in other parts of uh, Stokes County, is all of a sudden right next door. And it became a really like a wild west town up there. And in fact, at one point, one deputy sheriff shot another deputy sheriff to death over a woman who was a prostitute who worked across the street from where they did the shooting. Uh, you know, Winston was a different kind of place. You could actually move four blocks north, buy a piece of land, know everybody you knew before, own the land, which you couldn't do in Salem. And so as soon as there is a viable alternative to living in Salem, the idea in Salem that they can continue to sort of have the enforcement mechanism of expulsion becomes very problematic. And, and this is what we see very quickly after, in, in 49, the county is established. In 57, 1857, eight years later, the congregation has said, okay, we're giving up trying to control this community as a church town. Recognizing that its theocracy is no longer viable, Salem petitions the General Assembly and incorporates as a town. 
Winston, lest it be put at a disadvantage in attracting business and commerce, follows suit and is incorporated two years later. I don't know that the Moravians ever really, when they sold 51 acres, really thought that Winston was going to eclipse the town of Salem. I think they, they probably had thought it, at worst it would sort of co-occupy up there and all of those secular little nasty things that go on in the real world would sort of occur up in Winston. There was very little in the way of actual business uh, in Winston except business to serve the courthouse. And in the meantime, Port Salem was soundly enough based that uh, they continued to flourish in their own way. The major part of the economy was in Salem. Edward Below, the builder of the Below House, was the largest general merchandise business in this part of the state. And the Freeze brothers owned F&H Freeze Manufacturing. They had a cotton factory and a woolen factory. Um, and add that to the traditional craft businesses that all were very successful usually down there. Uh, Salem dominated the local economy. There was only one cloud on Salem's horizon. The North Carolina Railroad had bypassed the town in connecting the other major cities in the state. Belo and Freeze set about fixing this. They realized that there was no way their businesses could succeed without a rail connection. So they asked the North Carolina Railroad to build a spur to Winston and Salem, and they said, ha, huh, you missed out. We finished it. So they decided they would build their own, and they formed a railroad company, and Edward Below was the president, and, and Henry Freeze was the guy who got it done. And they went to work, and they built their own spur line, starting in Greensboro, until they got to Salem Creek and they found that building the trestle over Salem Creek was going to be far more expensive than they could afford. The railroad builders turned to the Richmond and Danville Railroad for help. Belo and Freeze intended the line to terminate in Salem, but when the difficult terrain east of Salem proved to be impractical, the railroad chose an easier path and routed the line to Winston. With this, Salem's fate was sealed. Thomas Jethro Brown, Civil War veteran, living over in Davie County, looks over here, he sees a railroad track, and he's interested in tobacco. And he thinks, okay, the farmers have to haul their tobacco all the way to Greensboro, where there were already tobacco factories. There were none here. What if I built something right there at the end of the railroad and started buying tobacco from farmers? And then I could ship it over there, mark it up a little bit, make a nice profit. So then you got this guy, Pleasant Henderson Haynes, sitting over in Davie County, and his family has a small factory, and he knows how to sell tobacco. And he looks and he sees a railroad, and he sees a tobacco warehouse, and he thinks, you know, if I built a factory right next to the tobacco warehouse, I could buy tobacco cheaper than the Greensboro manufacturers can, because they got to pay the shipping. Therefore, I can make as good a product as they make and sell it for less. So then you got this guy named Richard Joshua Reynolds sitting up in No Business Mountain in Patrick County, Virginia. And he's looking down and he sees a railroad and a tobacco warehouse and a tobacco factory. And he's thinking, that boy's pretty smart down there, but I bet I'm smarter. And I bet if I built a factory right next to him, I could do better. And so he, that's what he did. And this is what got everything started. It was, it was like a boom town. It was like... It was like Shanghai, you know, in, 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 uh, in our own time. People rushed in and they started building brick factories, brick warehouses. And they were going up, you know, weekly. Tobacco factories just started popping up all over the place. At one point there were 40 or more in the two towns and maybe two of them were in Salem. Uh, they all wanted to be where the depot was, where the end of the rail line was, and it was in Winston. As Winston boomed, so did its population. In 1872, the year before the railroad came, Winston had fewer than 500 residents. Salem, in contrast, had almost 1,000. By the end of the decade, Winston's population had grown to 2,800. 
and by 1890, the town counted more than 8,000 residents, three times the size of Salem. The economic boom attracted large numbers of African Americans to Winston, drawn by the opportunity to find work. African Americans were looking to get off those farms where they were uh, at that time probably sharecropping or tenant farming or something like that. And they were looking to get into some kind of job that would put money in their pocket. But Reynolds was always the one who hired the most black workers. So things were booming and he needed workers. So he started sending trains down to the cotton fields in South Carolina. The trains can get them, the trains can bring them in here. Uh, you look on some of those early maps of Winston and you see tenement buildings all up and down Liberty near the railroad track. And these were places where African Americans had lived those who came in here. The population in, uh, uh, in, in, in this area, uh, in, in Winston, started to increase the African American percentage of the total population, which finally reached uh, about 33%, about a third of the population. Salem's leaders were not blind to what was happening to their upstart offspring. In the 1870s, as Winston was just starting to take off, they made an effort to bring it back into their fold. July 4th, 1876, the centennial of the Declaration of Independence, a huge celebration. Robert Gray, who bought the first lot in Winston, was the featured speaker. There is perhaps no place in the state or in the South that has a brighter and more cheering prospect for the future than Salem and Winston. I speak of Salem and Winston as one place. Would that I could speak of them as under one name. Their interests are so interwoven that they cannot be separate or considered apart. Am I venturing upon dangerous ground or taking a step too far in advance of public opinion when I express the desire and belief that the two towns will at some time, not too far distant, plight their troth each to the other and be united in the bonds of a happy union? I speak of Salem and Winston as one place. Would that I could speak of them under one name. And that's the first time really I think anybody had ever said anything about the two towns becoming one. If you look at the, uh, the first um, auction of lots, Robert Gray, from the very beginning, was a major investor in Winston and wanted Winston to succeed as a, as a business center. He, he viewed himself as a reconciler, and, and it made sense uh, if the South was going to come back from, the, from the, the, the blood and the wreck of the Civil War, this local reconciliation needed, needed to happen. What he didn't know is that the mayor in Salem, Rufus Patterson, had been quietly talking to people about the same thing. And um, some of the people in Salem apparently got to thinking, you know, this is a chance to take it back. The Union Republican, February 13, 1879. There's a proposition on foot to amalgamate the towns of Salem and Winston under one corporation and each town has appointed a committee of 10 representative citizens to confer upon the matter and get it into shape for presentation to the citizens in public meeting. The People's Press, February 20th, 1879. We can see no real benefit for Salem in the proposed union at present. We may be short-sighted, but judging from past experience, we cannot endorse the movement. The Union Republican, February 13, 1879. We are not quite prepared to offer a positive opinion of the question, although we believe that nothing but good can result from concentration. The People's Press, March 6, 1879. A large meeting of the citizens of both towns was held in the courthouse Saturday afternoon to hear the consolidation question discussed by Messrs. Watson, Starbuck, and Judge Wilson for and Reverend Mr. Wiley and J.W. Allspaw against. Several others present made remarks pro and con, 
Action was taken regarding the new charter for the towns, and Mr. Watson left Monday evening for Raleigh to lay the charter before the legislature. Mr. Allspaw, strongly in opposition, departed at the same time. Watson, who would eventually run for governor, led the Republican charge and went down to Raleigh and convinced the legislature to issue a bill that allowing them to have a referendum on it. Uh, it got very nasty. The Winston Leader, April 8, 1879. Bad feelings have been engendered, not only between the two towns, but one class of citizen in Winston against another. There has been a great deal of useless talk sarcasm and ridicule, and we are sorry to see it. The People's Press, April 17, 1879. Election notice. An election will be held at the Commissioner's Hall in Salem on Saturday, the 19th day of April, 1879, upon the question of consolidating the two towns of Winston and Salem into one corporation, to be called the City of Salem. They lost in a landslide. I think there were maybe 12 votes against the bill in Salem. There were 300 and something against in Winston. The Moravians wanted to call the, the new town Salem and the people of Winston voted it down because they felt like that wouldn't be a proper thing since they were the larger entity of the group and, and, and going to continue to get much larger. The People's Press, April 24th, 1879. It is to be regretted that the subject was agitated at all. We hope that this vexed question has now been quieted for all time, and that in future, the relations between the two towns may be of the most pleasant nature. With the failed consolidation effort behind them, the residents of Salem and Winston picked up the pieces and went on with their petitioned civic life. Then the unexpected happened. Relations between the towns began to get better, propelled by the recognition that their interests were inextricably bound together. Within five years of the failed consolidation effort, a new term started creeping into popular use, the Twin City. It started with the debut of a new newspaper, the Twin City Daily, in 1885. This was followed by the formation of the Twin City Club in 1886 and the Twin City Hospital Association in 1887. All these developments were noted, with evident civic pride, in a pamphlet published by the Winston Chamber of Commerce. When we say this city or this place, we mean both Winston and Salem as they are practically inseparable. As both live in unity, they should be considered as one. The Twin City has been accepted as the proper cognomen, although each place still retains its post office and separate municipal government. Dr. D.P. Robbins, 1888. By then, the Weekly Sentinel had started a new trend when it began describing its circulation area as Winston-Salem. The chamber picked up on this and titled its pamphlet, A Descriptive Sketch of Winston-Salem. Of course, the Chamber of Commerce has very good reason to do this because they're promoting an entity, the city of Winston-Salem, as a, as a desirable place to come to, to do business in. I mean, if you want to get a, uh, a, a major league team to come to your city, you have to show how big your, your, your metropolitan area is, you have to show how big your your, your reach is, uh, and to, from a business point of view, to describe Winston and Salem as two places uh, just, just didn't, didn't, didn't hack it. Inevitably, this sense of shared identity gave rise to cooperative ventures that brought the towns even closer together. In 1887, the Salem Town Commissioners agreed to split with Winston the cost of renting a building in Winston to be used as a hospital for the Twin City. Based on the relative populations, Winston paid $200 a year, Salem paid $100. Salem also hired that year a company in Winston to install and operate the town's first electric streetlights. 
Intertown cooperation reached a new level of complexity and trust in 1890 when the two towns cooperated in building a sewer line from 4th Street in Winston and south along Tar Branch to Salem Creek. Then they built another sewer line to serve the eastern portions of Winston and Salem. Also in 1890, the towns signed a cooperative agreement under which each town's fire department would respond to a fire in either town. Step by step, Winston and Salem were being joined, if not in name, then certainly by deed. They see the necessity of uh, joining hands on, on lots of things, and, and, the, and, and they do start reaching out. From a planning point of view, uh, it was almost necessary. Uh, if you're going to do sewer lines, we all know that sewer lines, they have to go downhill uh, in order to work. And uh, so if downhill means that you cross uh, other properties, then you've got to do an easement. And w why not, if we can benefit from a joint sewer line, or if we can sign a joint agreements for um, fire protection, would we not want to do that? And theoretically, it's in everybody's benefit not to build replicating libraries and duplicating this and duplicating when you you're divided by one block, you know, you're divided by one street. In no small measure, this budding cooperation was spurred by the common destiny that the town's business leaders pursued. The period following the arrival of that first railroad spur in 1872 completed the roster of family businesses that would dominate the city for the next 130 years. What went on in the 80s was just extraordinary in every sense of the term. And I think one of the things that left Salem out is what was happening in Winston with all this growth and with these extraordinary men. Uh, P.A. Chains and R.J. Reynolds were the leaders, but there were a lot of others. The Freeze family, I think, is one of the most, maybe least understood uh, families uh, of, of the 19th century um, in Salem in the influence that they would eventually have on this community. And I, I would trace that back to Francis Freeze uh, particularly. He is the one who the Moravians would send north to learn about cotton manufacturing. He would be the one who would come back and set up the cotton mill. Uh, he uh, would not see the end of the Civil War. Uh, he would die in the, in the, during that period. But his sons would build upon that empire. They became the infrastructure people. They got into power. First in gas, they built a gas plant and sold gas for power. And then when electricity came along, they jumped right into that and got into the Freeze Power and Manufacturing Company. They were visionaries. They, when they saw something, they said, ah, this is gonna be needed, we'll do it. And people in Winston who were doing businesses needed a bank to manage funds. The Gray family moved in created uh, Wachovia Bank. Robert Gray had a remarkable bunch of sons who uh, became a major force. They were founders of Wachovia National Bank. Probably his best known sons were Eugene E. Gray, who was a lawyer and who had a finger in just about every pie in town, and James A. Gray, who was founder of the bank and suddenly tobacco, textiles, other things take off. They take off in Winston in part because the land's there, for one thing, the railroad's there, and then increasingly the money's there. People in Salem are investing in Winston. The Freeze, they're investing in Winston, Wachovia Bank. The, these, these things are actually being developed with some cash and capital from people in, in, in Salem. And this was a magnet, and you started seeing more and more Salem people establishing their businesses in Winston because the courthouse square was the center of the universe. Once again, it's breaking down the fetters, allowing business to occur, so it would have been good business. And I'll tell you what the, the big one was, was the streetcars. Winston already had electric streetlights. Salem was still using gas streetlights. We're talking 1890-ish here. Uh, and Salem Street, Main Street, was not paved and Winston's was. And I think that's kind of the pivotal moment when they started talking streetcars. 
people in Salem realized that if they built a streetcar system in Winston and the streetcars didn't come to Salem, they were dead. And the Freeze, of course, wanted that streetcar line down there too. And so Salem suddenly got modern, paved Main Street, went to electric streetlights. They had them installed, but they didn't turn them on until the streetcar line was finished. And the streetcar line originally ran from the square in Winston to Salem Creek, below Salem, because they built the car barn on the other side of the creek. And then, the day that the first streetcar ran, that night, Salem turned on their electric lights for the first time. And I think after that, there wasn't really any difference between the two towns. As the turn of the century approached, the two towns had settled into their roles. The Moravians, throughout history, are very practical people. Uh, you know, they, they know what it takes to survive and in fact were able to uh, manipulate or adjust their thinkings to accommodate their agendas within the framework that they were operating. Salem had to go through some kind of uh, catharsis to decide who we are. And as they saw this behemoth town rising, one could see the, the handwriting on the wall that, that Winston was going to be the powerful uh, element and Salem was going to fade into the background. If you, if you drive up Main Street, through Salem. You always have this feeling that you're going up, 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 up <laughs> till you get to the courthouse in Winston. Salem, you know, being at the bottom end of Main Street, went through a catharsis of, of what are we? And uh, they decided, well, we are the Moravian community. We are Salem College. We are history. We are tradition. If we can't be the business behemoth, then we have this other identity. But in fact, Salem's identity was under assault. In 1899, the residents of Salem learned that the Postal Service was intent on closing the Salem Post Office. Salem had previously defeated just such a move in 1891. But this time, the Post Office would not be dissuaded. 1891, the post office proposed closing the Salem station and uh, having one station in Winston called the Winston-Salem Post Office, and actually called the Winston Post Office, and the people in Salem had a fit. A post office is an important identity to a community. It is, you know, uh, uh, it, it, it says that you are a place and you are something that is, is important. And you go from being a, a place on a map, a destination, to a footnote in history. Salem did not want to be a footnote. It was a very proud place. And so the citizens of, of Salem said, well, not only are you taking our post office away from us, which is grievous enough, but you are taking our identity away from us. We're, we're not Winston, we're Salem. So they went up to Washington and lobbied very hard and killed that deal. But the post office never gave up on it and in 1899 they finally did do it. On March 15, 1899, the Salem Town Commissioners held an emergency meeting. The clerk read into the minutes an article which had been printed in the Washington Post two days earlier. The Washington Post, March 13, 1899. Postmaster General Smith has ordered that the post office of Winston-Salem be consolidated July 1st. The post office at Salem will be made a station of the Winston Post Office. The consolidated post office, for the present, will have the hyphenated name of Winston-Salem. This is against the policy of the post office department and is done now only in deference to local sentiment. It will not be continued longer than necessary when the consolidated post office will be known as Winston. As it is, it will be difficult to put on a post office stamp or die the name of Winston-Salem and have it legible. It is too long. Once again, the citizens of Salem mobilized to save their name. 
A delegation from the town traveled to Washington, but this time the best they could do was secure an agreement to retain the Winston-Salem postmark indefinitely. Over the next 10 years, the use of Winston-Salem as a joint reference became so common that leaders decided the time was right to undertake a third attempt at consolidation. The second attempt had been short-lived. In 1893, Robert B. Glenn, a local attorney who would be elected governor in 1904, suggested that Winston and Salem consolidate as the city of Winston. Glenn's timing could not have been worse. Salem's residents had just battled the post office to retain their identity, and there was no way they were about to voluntarily surrender it through consolidation. His efforts went nowhere. But with the post office, and just about everyone else now referring to the area as Winston-Salem, the solution was obvious. The two municipalities could consolidate under the name that everyone was already using. This third push started in 1910, when the Retail Merchants Association and the Board of Trade again raised the issue. Jacob Ludlow, as president of the Board of Trade, appointed a committee to study the issue of consolidation. When you look at Ludlow and you look at the committee that they created to study the potential for consolidation, it was a very carefully chosen group. Almost every key person in the community. And a thing that I noted is that they listed this committee in the newspaper and it was listed alphabetically. They wanted to be very careful not to put somebody ahead of somebody else because this was a very touchy thing that already <laughs> had a couple of disasters in trying to join the cities together. For two years, the committee studied the issue in detail, compiling information about each town's tax base, population, ordinances, utilities, and tax rates, and drafting legislation to consolidate the two. Their report was presented at a specially called meeting of the Board of Trade on December the 12th, 1912. More than 200 business and civic leaders crowded into the county courthouse as Ludlow opened the meeting. The Winston people came to this meeting ready to go. There's no question in my mind about that. The Winston people have been ready for 20, 30 years to join the two towns. He had to convince some critical leaders in Salem. And if you look at who was at that meeting, uh, they were all there. Whatever the cause, a great fence seems to have been erected between the two communities and has persisted in staying erected to the outside world, which interprets it to mean that Salem must be awfully cranky or Winston awfully contrary or perhaps both. The purpose of this special meeting of the Board of Trade is to determine whether or not this organization shall begin movement to tear down the fence and henceforth have one great community. This thing was beautifully staged managed, the whole thing. When Ludlow made his speech at this meeting and immediately Major Alexander jumps up and makes the next speech, and it's connected to what Ludlow was saying, but in a more uh, business-like, let's get moving kind of thing. The meeting concluded with the unanimous call for consolidation, kicking off a vigorous public campaign to accomplish the elusive goal. The city's leading newspapers, cheering on the effort, supplied a steady stream of headlines to drum up support amid rumors that Winston would burden Salem with an unfair share of taxes, that Salem would not be bringing as much to the Union as Winston, and that Winston would imperil Salem's moral purity. A committee of 100 of the Twin Cities leading citizens was formed to promote the effort, among them Richard J. Reynolds. If it be true that Salem will derive a little more benefit from consolidation than Winston, that is no reason why we should not consolidate, provided it is likewise true that Winston will receive some benefit. Should I refuse to make a trade in which I would profit because the other fellow would make a profit also? Such a course generally pursued would paralyze business. 
As in 1879, the citizens in Winston and Salem, voting separately, would each have to approve consolidation for it to take effect. The issue was never in doubt in Winston, but in Salem, the vote was expected to be close. Winston, by 1913, was ready to surround Salem through business development, through the construction of residences and uh, outlying businesses. So it's almost as if Salem was surrounded and had almost no choice. You could go to infinity without consolidating, but it certainly wasn't very convenient and it wasn't very economical. I don't see any way you can have two towns that close to each other that that just continue to exist as separate entities, it doesn't make sense. And not to mention the fact that, as we said, uh, it was the will of the power structure. And once the will of the power structure uh, is set, it's going to happen. In the end, Salem bowed to the inevitable and approved the merger. 385 citizens voted for consolidation, 224 voted against. In Winston, consolidation carried easily, 804 and 260 against. The legislation authorizing the vote stipulated that, if approved, consolidation would take effect on the first Friday after the first Monday in May. On May 9th, Winston and Salem became a single city. But this detail eluded the local newspapers, which proclaimed the consolidation effective with the first meeting of the new Board of Aldermen on May 12th. For all time hereafter, the newspaper noted, and no matter whether it be for better or for worse, the knot has been tied and there is no divorce court that can sever the tie. Given the reality of the way business operates, and uh, the way in which political systems operate in the 21st century in terms of how we do planning, it was inevitable that the two were going to have to become one sooner or later. Maybe not 1913, but sooner or later it, it had to happen. I'd say I'm glad that they didn't consolidate in 1879, because I don't think Salem would have been an appropriate name for the whole city. It means peace. And Winston was far from peaceful. I think Salem got the best of the, of, of the uh, situation there by always being associated with Winston. And, and, and perhaps that's appropriate because Salem was the beginning. And we have to respect that beginning. And it was an unusual and a very special beginning. Salem was going to be, if it hadn't been for the restoration group coming together, you know, 60 years ago, Salem was just going to be another lost neighborhood. The historic towns of Winston and Salem are so different, so completely different, that it could not be named Winston. It could not be named Salem. It could have been named Taft or Lincoln or some other made-up name, but it couldn't be called just Winston or just Salem. It was either both or a new name. I do think it's important that, that both names were preserved because of the history of the Moravians here. And without the Moravians, there would have been no Salem. Without Salem, there would have been no Forsyth. Without Forsyth, there would have been no Winston. You know, you step back and you say, what would Winston-Salem be without a Salem? Not simply in changing the name, but what would it be as a community? What were the value systems that were implanted here? And you look at uh, something like education, for example, the earliest girls' school, the boys' school on the square. And I would draw a straight line from those two phenomena right down Main Street to Wake Forest, bought for and paid for to come to this community from someplace else. Why is, you know, music so important here, School of the Arts? Can you trace that back to the Moravian Band? And, and I, you've got to say that there's a certain ethic, which I think then spills over into making an environment that is having a work ethic, 
having an environment in, in, in commerce and in banking that would allow the other industries to come in and do the wealth that Winston-Salem would enjoy. So you trace those things back and you say, that's the legacy of, of the Winston and the Salem.